I am very pleased to be part of what I believe is an effort that can lead all of us to beginning to pull in the same direction. As I thought about today and I think about what we are trying to start here, I hope this is the beginning of a movement. I think of this as I do the rowing teams that grow successfully uh, in crew competitions. And that need for perfect timing and pulling together in the same direction. And I believe firmly that the adverse childhood experience work that we can do as a community is the roadmap that will allow us to be successful in solving all of these challenges for our community. That is why I'm honored to serve in this capacity. I'm also honored to support the work of AHA in trying to roll out this roadmap for our community. And I hope that you will join me in financially supporting this work and supporting this work with your time and your commitment as you have today. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to be here with you. And I look forward to all that we're going to learn today collectively. I would like to now turn it over to Chris Evans on behalf of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, and Wake Med were two of our initial corporate supporters of this work. We are also very grateful today for our sponsors, Duke Raleigh and McAdams. Chris serves as the Director of State Legislative and Regulatory Affairs at Blue Cross, and as importantly to me, has been a friend for over 20 years. Thank you, Chris, for being here. Um, I, I want to um, thank you. I'm proud to be here on behalf of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Um, I'm also proud to be here on a personal level um, to serve as a member of the advisory board with, with this group. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield has been serving the state of North Carolina for 85 years. Not only have we offered health insurance to children, families, and employers and their employees, but we've also made an extraordinary commitment to the community because we understand that the health and well-being of the citizens of North Carolina is more than just visiting your doctor. It's about what the community does and those wraparound services. Blue Cross has built homes across the state. We have partnered with um, communities to build playgrounds. We have assembled hundreds of bicycles for children um, whose parents are in the military. And we've partnered with schools to help find innovative ways to help children succeed in education. Um, you may have heard recently that we also have a new CEO, Dr. Patrick, Con um, Dr. Patrick Conway. He comes to us as a CMS Chief Medical Officer and as the Director for CMS's Innovation Center. Uh, as a father of four and a pediatrician who volunteers in the community and school practices, he has seen firsthand the impact of ACES and understands how important the work that we're doing here today. Um, in fact, his leadership has reinvigorated the cross, and we're very excited to have him focus on value-based care and understanding the need to address adverse um, childhood experiences with the better policies. He recently authored a um, co-authored a an article in the Harvard Business Journal about the, the need for comprehensive and coordinated care for children, and, and this speaks directly to that. Preventing adverse childhood experiences and helping kids build resiliency to those experiences are central to making our state a better place to live. ACEs can have significant long-term impacts, and these impacts affect the quality of life for all of us. North Carolina thrives only when all North Carolinians thrive. I can speak to that on a personal level, part of the reason I'm standing here today, because as Lauren talked about, I'm currently on the board chair for Interact. I've been involved in <coughs> working with domestic and sexual assault um, in Wayne County for over 20 years. It doesn't seem that long. Um, I also was a teacher, um, and I taught at some of the most prestigious private schools, but I also taught at um, in schools in North Carolina where children <coughs> would be the first in their generation to graduate from high school. My husband has been a teacher for 26 years. I've had children go through, go through the county the public school system. And I can tell you the impact of children who are homeless, who are struggling to survive at home, who 
who don't know where the next meal is going to be. Um, they don't care about getting an A on that social studies test. They care about surviving. And they bring that experience with them to school and to the classroom. And we talk about the individual experiences and other people's problems, but those children bring those issues to the classroom with them, and that impacts all of us. And I know each and every one of you, with the work that you do, understands that impact, not from an individual perspective, but also from a community perspective, and how important it is to be able to address ACEs. The work being done by AHA to help mitigate ACEs is incredibly important to our state. The impact, uh, it impact, ACEs impacts children of every socioeconomic status. And as we know, that is relevant to our recognition of health disparities in, the most, in our most vulnerable populations. Blue Cross Blue Shield is honored to be here and to be part of this organization and to be part of this effort. And I want to thank you very much for this privilege. Call up Andy Curtis on behalf of Wake Med. Andy serves as the government affairs manager. Andy, thank you for being here and we appreciate the support of Wake Med. Good morning. Uh, Andy Curtis with Wake Med, and I bring greetings to you from the entire Wake Med family as well as our CEO, Donald Gibson, who is um, not able to be here with us today. Um, there's also another staff member here at the meeting, which is Bob, and there. Um, Ed was our, was our uh, nurse manager in the Children's Emergency Department. Um, and, you know, we see over 40,000 uh, children a year uh, in our emergency department. And, unfortunately, we see them when they're experiencing a traumatic event. Uh, and so, in our hospital partners, I know that they the same thing. Um, and when they are with us, we do all that we can to give them care, love, and compassion. We treat them like our own. And I know that we need to discharge them because they're part of our staff. So that's why we are so grateful to AHA for bringing such an amazing team together on um, the advisory board. Amazing leaders in Wake County, and we're so thankful and proud to be a part of this work. Um, and I'm also really excited that you all are here in the room, and we can work together and find out ways that either you individually or as an organization can help build resiliency in Wake County. So, on behalf of Wake Men, thank you so much for the work that AHA is doing. us this morning and for making it possible for so many people to see the film resilience over the last few months and we are in the process of scheduling more screenings so thank you Marvels. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors. Lauren mentioned some of our sponsors and we also want to honor our defense level supporters. Lauren Freeman, Calix Engineering, and the YMCA of the Triangle. And I want to thank all of you in the room who are leading on this and will be leading. Thank you all for being here. So let's get a big knock to the room. Will you stand up if one of these fits for you? First, have you seen the film Resilience? Wow. All right. Thank you. Now stand if you've encouraged someone else to see the film. <laughs> All right. And now how about if you consider or already taken a personal action to build a building? Oh my goodness, you guys. Thank you. Okay, and now if you serve on the ACES Resilience Steering Committee or Advisory Board, 
increasing knowledge um, is really meaningful unless we change actions as well. So just know that's what we're doing today. I want to give you one quick example. Caroline Welch, who's the president and general manager of ABC 11, saw the film, and when she walked out, she said it made her think of all of the first responders and her reporters who walk into traumatic situations every day. And it made her want to do something to support her reporters. Uh, that's the kind of thing she would think of it because of the work she does, the world she lives in, and that is true for everybody else in the room. None of us will think of the things someone else will. So, I want to introduce now our first speaker, Alice Lutz, CEO of Final Family Services. Alice is one of the people who has been leading this work for years. Triangle Family Services serves so many people in this county. And as you listen to Alice, listen for ways that the counselor talks to the young woman and listen for the ways she personally builds resilience with her employees. And personally, thank you. Space here in Wake County for 35 years. And it's really interesting leading an 80 year old nonprofit organization that deals with families in crisis and trauma. Um, how do we combine the direct services that are needed to help families move from trauma to crisis to stability for sustainability for our community? So, a touch of history lesson here. When the um, divestiture happened a few years ago with the mental health services and the Alliance Behavioral became our managed care organization, Triangle Family Services took a look at the current mental health services that we are providing within the comprehensive suite of services that we have. We have three service area program areas. We have 10 programs. So our work with the courts, our work with supervised visitation, our work with domestic offenders and uh, domestic violence situations was the right fit for us to go into a deeper dive into evidence-based models. And so we had our staff, our therapists, and, and we have a psychiatrist trained in trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy and cognitive processing therapy. And what we believe this will do is to work with families in a more comprehensive way and with various partners in the so, we look at how we best partner and do have a sliding scale fee to offer these additional services and are looking to expand these services. I have to give a very quick shout out to Thorne here. I don't know where he went right over there, band together. So, we do have a solution we with band together partner this year. So, we're raising additional million dollars to put towards this immediately in 2018. So we're really trying to figure out how do we launch this in a sustainable way. So I think that one thing that would be helpful is to talk about a specific example and specific tools within that example of how our therapists worked in trauma-informed um, care for this family as well as working with the parent. So um, Allison began working with a 16-year-old young adult when called her Carol. Carol disclosed to her mother that she had been sexually abused by her stepfather since she was 12 years old. The family was traumatized and broken. The mother, in a state of shock and grief, blamed herself, which is natural. She simply couldn't understand how she missed four years of sickness. The therapist Allison can recall vividly when Carol walked into the room. She was guarded. She was resistant. She, there were many signs that she was traumatized and trying to avoid those feelings. She believed, like many survivors, that if she tried hard enough to forget, everything would get better. We know from research that's not the case. If left untreated, the effects of sexual abuse can have devastating and lasting impacts on a person's ability to function every day. Allison proceeded with trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy to treat Carol's symptoms. 
The therapist was determined to help Carol cope with her symptoms and mend relationships with her mother. After a few sessions, Carol's initial reactions of being guarded began to fade. Many people who enter our offices never thought it would be them, and they're afraid to confront. They're fearful. We move the per at the person's pace. Carol learned cognitive coping strategies to help her replace unhelpful thoughts. The best part about this therapy, Carol's mom went along with this therapy and was learning the same tools. <coughs> This was helpful for her mother's process of sexual abuse and was able to be a strong support for Carol. As part of the therapy, Carol writes a trauma narrative. She processes the details with her mother. The mother's burden was heavy. Through processing, Carol was able to change negative thoughts to more accurate ones. The therapist continues to process and explore all the sexual abuse around Carol. Through many tears, many hugs, and sorrows, many pain, recovery, survival, and a repaired mother-daughter relationship. In trauma-focused cognitive behavior, ther behavioral therapy, 80% of children experience reduction, reduction in their symptoms. In cognitive processing therapy, on an average or positive outcome in 12 to 24 sessions, with many changes in just eight sessions. This evidence-based model as part of the work identified in the movie Resilience and part of the Omniverse Childhood Experiences. Recently, Carol had to go to federal court and read her victim statement. Carol was prepared and ready. This is a moment of victory for her. She read her statement. She was brave. Not only that, to face her perpetrator. At the end of the trial, everybody embraced tears of joy. Carol was brave and received admiration. Her perpetrator was sentenced to federal prison. There are points that therapists work with families, and they're called stuck points. Um, it helps people identify the challenges of these points and rewind. If you think of a movie rewinding, almost like on Groundhog's Day, if anybody saw that movie, and there were different outcomes every day that you could turn. And so the tools that are taught for these families and the resilience that they can have are things that they can replay in their mind to help reset what the beliefs, their beliefs are and what positive outcomes can be. The client can become their own therapist in a way and challenge their thoughts to come up with new, new and more accurate ways. This type of therapy is not new, it's been going on for 25 years. We heard in the movie Resilience, $3 trillion is spent on healthcare, yet 5% on prevention. The number one factor in determining a child's success is the stability of the parent or caregiver. Toxic stress creates all kinds of health challenges. So how can we, as leaders, providers, be there in a way that our community needs us? One of the things I would really challenge you today is to put your mask on first. Figure out what some of the tools are that you can do to prevent burnout, you can do for self-care. I spend a great deal of time in leading our agency and the staff and looking at how do we prevent burnout. We deal with a crisis and trauma every day, seven days a week, 13,000 families, that's a lot. A trauma. So how do we do self-care? And we implement simple ways and simple strategies. So I know that most of you have seen the movie Resilience. I'm going to give you a cheat sheet that would really encourage you as a takeaway today. There's a 16-minute YouTube video with Dr. Nadine Burke. I would really encourage you to download that, click on it, watch it, and most importantly, forward it to five people. You can do that today. Because that really continues our conversation and allows them a point of entry to continue the conversation and encourage them to see the resilience movie. Um, I know that there are dates on the table and it is 45 minutes to an hour well spent. Thank you for being here, being part of that conversation.
Next we'll hear from Danica Coleman Robinson. She's with the Apex Police Department. Her job is as a victim advocate. She's going to talk with us about how buddies are using their understanding of trauma to work differently. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. A traumatic event is an incident that can be shocking and emotionally overwhelming for victims. Police response often means that something traumatic has happened to someone, either a car accident, burglary, domestic violence, sexual assault, the list goes on. Victims respond differently to trauma, and this response can greatly impact their interaction with the police. On the other hand, police response can also impact the experience that a victim goes through. Therefore, it is important that police respond using a trauma-informed approach. So what is trauma-informed? It's used to describe organizations and practices that incorporate an understanding of the pervasiveness and impact of trauma, and that are designed to reduce re-traumatization, support healing and resiliency, and to address the root causes of the abuse and violence. Training officers on recognizing trauma is important so that officers understand the effects that trauma has on the brain, memory, and a victim's responses. For example, there are neurobiological reasons for why a victim responds in the way that they do. They may laugh, they may cry, they may be cavalier, they may be all of those things in a short amount of time. Neurobiological changes also make it difficult for a victim to remember exactly what happened. They may describe events out of order, they may forget some details and remember them later in a follow-up interview. So a victim's re reaction to trauma should never be misinterpreted as them lying because they may be all over the place, they may not remember certain details. Um, there are neurobiological reasons for this response. For these reasons, it is important that police receive training on the impacts of trauma and how to provide a trauma-informed approach. This training equips the officers with the tools they need to respond skillfully and empathetically to individuals for whom trust can be a critical issue without having their own reactions interfere. It is also important that police address the critical needs of victims, which can include safety, support, a need for information, collaboration, and empowerment. Police are often the first person in the criminal justice system that a victim encounters, and this interaction needs to be positive. At the Apex Police Department, we bring in a new pool from the North Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and she provides training to various agencies on various topics. Our most recent training with her included trauma and understanding the effects of trauma and how trauma impacts interviews. So now what does this look like in action? One day, a young lady came to the police department to report an ongoing issue that she was having with a parent. She wanted to know what options were available to her, and she wanted to know that her parents were not going to be notified. She was over 18 at this point. So we couldn't tell the parents, so we could assure her of that. The responding officer provided her with safety, addressed her safety concerns, and assured her that her parents would not be notified. The officer also showed her empathy, took time to listen to her, understand her feelings in a supportive way which helped build support, which helped build a rapport and trust with her. The officer provided her with an immediate referral to myself. I responded, introduced myself to her, reassuring her that everything would be okay and confidential, 
I showed her empathy. I took time to listen, to understand. After listening to her and building a rapport, I asked her a question to try to get to the root cause of the abuse, at which time she disclosed that one of her parents had been abusing her sexually. And at that time, she explained even more abuse that she had been experiencing. That um, at one point in time, she threatened to commit suicide at school, and she begged her teachers not to tell her parents. Well, they, they had to. When she got home, one parent told her she should have killed herself. The other parent told her that I only want to get you help because if you kill yourself, it'll look bad on me if I don't get you help. She never disclosed the abuse to her teacher, to her school therapist, or to the therapist that her parents sent her to. While in, still in grade school, but a little bit older, she got enough courage to call the police to report physical abuse. Nothing was done because she didn't have any physical injuries at that time. She never disclosed anything else to the police at that point. The outcome. After revealing all of this information, it was time to inform, collaborate, and empower. I empowered her by providing her with her rights and options and supported her in her decision. She wanted to take baby steps, and I was there to support that. I provided her with immediate resources and referrals and followed up on those services. I provided her with ongoing support, sat in with her on an interview with the detective, met with her numerous times to help follow through the plan that she chose. I contacted agencies and I advocated for her. I'm happy to say that she received the necessary services that she needed. She's thriving back in school. So using this trauma-informed approach, we were able to reduce re-traumatization, support her healing and resiliency, and address the root cause of the abuse. Thank you. Chairs up front, there are a couple here, a handful here. If that's would anyone at a table with one or more chair open, please raise your hand. I know sometimes people don't want to get up, but when we have the table conversations, we're sure you're going to want to be up front, so please do step forward. Okay, now we're going to hear from Kimberly Jackson Sater. She's a trauma counselor with the Valley Police Department. Listen to the things she does to support people who experience trauma. Something to, to give me faith that we're helping to go forward. 
Okay, so I just listened to her at Valley and she went to the program. She told me her daughter was dead. She was a single mom, raised her daughter, daughter was pregnant until she was 20. They fought addiction together, trying to get uh, treatment and things like that. She just felt at a kind of loss. Uh, so the timing of my call was so meaningful for her, just to know that someone out there cared enough to reach out to her and to listen to her. To her. In that initial phone call, I was able to start debriefing some of the trauma that she'd experienced. She was the one that bought her daughter, had a whole night living on it, attempted to revive her. Um, and so for her to be able just to talk about those initial thoughts and feelings was so, so helpful for her. She didn't have anyone that she could share that with, or she felt too ashamed to talk about those things. Um, and then from there, I found out that her regular therapist was on sick leave for the next month. So she really felt isolated. Like, who am I going to talk to? I already have been kind of working on it, but now I'm in this. So I think that's part of that. I offer free counseling, and during the time that her therapist was on me, she came in and had some sessions with me. And from there, she started to make some meetings from the experiences that she had. She disclosed to me that prior to her daughter's death, she also had lost two other friends to heroin overdoses in the past year. And so for her, that gave her this inner um, knowing that there was more for her to do with the community, that she didn't want other families to experience the pain that she had when we took her daughter and go home. Now, a year later, she's able to work in her own ways to help other families to her. So, lack of resilience, or something magical that you do with these phone calls, something you might do is a calm, reassuring voice, a listening ear, validating how they feel, allowing them not to feel judged, and know that somebody out there cares for them. Um, and I think that is so beautiful, that someone cares for them to reach out to you. Um, the next example, um, is what I do for people who are in shock. And so there's traumatic deaths that happen all the time in our community. And yes, I'll give an initial call, but sometimes if any of you have ever experienced a traumatic death, your mind's going hundred miles per hour, you're not getting clearly be quite giving you great information, but you're not retaining it. And so what I do with that one is I send a condolence card. Um, there's a good one. Just something that they can come back to when that shock word is off and when they decide, you know what, I need some resources. I do need to support because I can't do this on my own. And at that point, they can reach out um, for services. And so, an example of this was a mother who was by time for suicide. Um, I think her father's mother buddy for services, but she wanted information to answer her, so I wrote her a book. Um, I gave her some free resources and some things about support groups in the community. And what came from that was when she was ready to start working, she was going to call us. She nearly called us, she didn't care about her life. And she, for a while, went down and ready for some sessions. So she came in for an initial session and we started talking about the trauma. And then from there, she was able to identify that she felt really connected to the support groups that she started to attend for her community. And so that's where she's doing right now. She's exploring this grief through trauma where other family members are experiencing it and understand what she's going through, and it's working for her. And what I've learned is that everybody's going to go through different stages and phases, and it's okay. So, whatever it takes to help for those people, we want to encourage that. That's what this is all about. It's just finding the whole set of support group that's helpful. My last example that I want to give you is just how we can do counseling in a trauma informed way. Um, and so I reached out to um, a woman who witnessed a traumatic car accident in a veteran of the field. And so for the first time that I started talking to her, she was like, yes, I can't even think about this trauma because I'm so worried about my own child. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, you just witnessed something horrific and all you talk to me about your teenager. But at the time, it's like, more about what's going on with your daughter. And so this lady disclosed to me that her daughter was in an kind of abusive um, adolescent relationship. And during this time, um, her daughter didn't know what to do. And so I said, tell me more about what's the relationship, how it was dramatic. And so what she told me was the guy that her daughter was dating had attempted suicide on medication. The last time that he attempted suicide, um, her daughter cried 911 because she thought that he already put himself in this on and that um, she had just gotten some other contacts from him. So from there, I qualified her daughter to do some trauma, trauma counseling uh, sessions for me. And that allowed this mom to be able to start to process her trauma because then she was able to access services for her daughter. She felt guilty that she could have services for free, but her daughter was going to something that she couldn't afford to help with for her daughter. Um, so working with her daughter, I was able to help her daughter set some boundaries with the relationship, increase her confidence in herself. Um, by the end of the work together, she said, Kimberly, I'm not depressed. She's like, I feel like myself before I was in this relationship. Uh, so being able to just see feelings where they are, the tools that they can use in their daily life to recover and be resilient for the moment. And from there, this mother went on um, to get yeah. her own work. She realized what her triggers were to her trauma, and then she also realized what she needed to do for post traumatic growth. And that was she purchased safety tests. And now she's around, and anytime she sees someone in the community that 
So that gives us a commonality to build on. And that's what this model focuses on. It's the sensation. We've heard the word resumes. This model also uses that and it focuses on what's called a resiliency zone. That is a zone in which we do have emotional ups and downs, but even when in that zone, we're able to make reasonable and rational responses and choices and behaviors. And there are other times that we bounce out of that zone. Sometimes that's a good thing. There are times we might be under visible threat, for instance, and we freak out and we run. That might be an appropriate thing for the moment. The concern is for people who have competitive stress and trauma is that they get stuck out in high or low. That's when it's a concern. So this model is focused on trying to improve and widen that disease but also to learn how to bring oneself back in to that by, by addressing the dysregulation of the state. So, it again, it's based on, on the concept of neuroscience. We talk about the brain as a fairly simple organism, where you have brain stem, which is considered the survival brain. That's where that vital clean happens. Everything that we go through in life, whether we know it or not, we first evaluate for that need. We then have an emotional brain, and in that is what's called a big goal, which is the smoke alarm, the parking dog, or whatever. It's what's scanning everything I'm seeing, feeling, and hearing, how much of a threat it is. So you can imagine if I'm for instance, walking through the woods and I see a stick, I think it's a snake, I run every time I see a snake. I have a problem. But if I think it's always a stick and step on a snake, then I have another problem. So it's able to differentiate those responses in a way. And then you have the thinking frame, which is where we make our good decisions. So when it's all put together well, it's not like that. But when it's overstimulated, dysregulated, it does like this. You can't access that part of the brain. That's what we call what we're talking about permanent. That's a concept that kids grasp really well. When I had the opportunity to be exposed to this work, I went up to Parma County Schools, and I remember walking through the halls of principals and telling all the great things they do. And here's this little kid in the escort in the office. And I was like, oh, yeah, that is he stopped and says, Johnny, what? what's going on? So we'll get this. I bumped out of my resiliency center. <laughs> right then, I was slow. <laughs> you know, there was no, I didn't do this, so and so did this, I'm being treated up to nothing. And so I began to, to explore that. As we move forward with this, we have begun to train trainers in this model and it's a little out of structure. And I'll say too, we're working with a group called All Triangle Resilience in the community to do the same thing. We try to help bring this to the community. So that that's something that, that we can share because again, the word is community resilience. You know, another example that, that I would like to share is if we, we First of all, the model is geared toward learning how to do this for yourself. So, as you all were talking about how do you care for yourself, you know, you're not holding it together, you really can't know what to do. But beyond that, because you don't need to understand the concept, after doing our five day training for trainers, we had one of the exercises that we did. One of our staff went back in school and they got caught up in the training. So, it says, out of control, I caught my hands and they all. This first time we train walks in, first thing we do is is, is volunteer. So would you mind walking in? They take a walk, walk along. So hey, can we just sort of stand up here, look outside, and start what kind of colors do you see around? What's what's going on with them? The Eskimos just make it quick. The next day the teacher comes in and says, What the heck did you do with this kid? What do you mean? Well, he started to get stirred up in class, and he walks up and says, 
Where are my colors? Let me see. <laughs> so, again, he didn't know the concept, but it worked. It's the most hopeful thing. You know, I'm really excited just telling you about it. It is so hopeful and so progressive that I encourage you to, along with the many other strategies that have been presented. talking about that's also described as self-regulating the nervous system and again is something we all can do uh, he described a few key physical behaviors um, walking around that's one of the key pieces of prep because it gets you feeling your body and that starts making the shift uh, the whole observing colors piece that's a mindfulness technique and it also makes a shift in your brain, and you'll notice we also talked about giving kids choices. The can we take a walk? Are you ready to go back inside? And so, I hope you really notice those things. Now, I'll introduce Kristen Jabonja, director of Safe Child, and listen to how Kristen talks with children and also the work she's doing coordinating services across many organizations. Good morning. Um, I feel like I'm following my Wake County family. We uh, could not do what we do at Save Child without the District Attorney's Office, Colorado <coughs> Police Department, Apex Police Department, and all the other law enforcement jurisdictions, um, the Wake County Public School System, Blue uh, Cross for Children of Toronto, all have been such a fabulous leader in these efforts in our community, and so many other family members in this audience today and outside of these walls that have partnered with Safe Child for 25 years in our goal of eliminating child abuse in Wake County and really creating resilient children from the very, very beginning, the most early stages of their lives through their childhood and early adulthood so we can ultimately have the trauma community together. Um, I, I want to also say that, you know, it's, it's not easy what any of us are talking about today, um, but we've all said many times in life, you know, we don't just do what's easy. It's about doing sometimes what's tough, what takes us out of our resiliency zone. Um, yesterday, my office manager and I were having some friction. She says, I'm having a cow, and I said, but my cow is bigger than yours. And, uh, and everybody laughed, and the tension was cut. Uh, but it's willing to muck around in areas with children and families that do take us out of our comfort zone. But that's what they need, and that's what they expect from us. And I know that you're here today because you believe that. Um, in 1980, there was a book published uh, it was referred to then and still now, many years later, as kind of the parenting Bible. And that is really Safe Child's focus, working with parents raising their children and working with their children, that entire family system, and grandparents and any caregivers for that matter. Um, the book is called, um, and I'm sure many of you have heard of it, is Talking So Children Will Listen and Listen So Children Will Talk. And the most important phrase in the title of that book, and one of the things for you to think about today, when you are trying to help yourself, when you're trying to help another person, small or big, young or old, is listening so children, people, human beings can feel safe to talk, can feel safe to share, and that you're keeping them in that zone where they can open up to you. And um, what I've found through my experience as a safe child and what my colleagues have found and what we've experienced is some of our best trained professionals out there that are only trying to do their best at their jobs sometimes fall on their face from the very beginning because we want to fix it. We are the first responders. We are the heroes in our community. We need to save the day because when you look at that child, and if that child has chosen you to be their special person, you've got to save the day. But how do you go about saving the day and providing hope 
healing and positive outcomes for the future for that child um, can, can go off tracks real easily. And so I encourage you to think about, um, is your goal to help this child be done in a way that's helpful or maybe adding to the trauma that they've already experienced? So our natural inclination is to ask more questions. So a child decides, you are, you're, you are their chosen person. <coughs> they are going to share with something that they have either had bottled in for years. You can think about the person that Danica spoke about this morning how many years she had those egregious experiences. I mean, I go off adverse egregious. I mean, I go much deeper than that. Um, but she's had those stuff to the side. Um, and what if her response, what if the Apex Police Department, because they've got a protective community, they need to know details. But just asking and asking and asking and asking and asking all over again. And so we have worked really hard in this community and with our staff at how do you get information? How do you talk to kids? How do you listen to kids so they will continue to share with you so you can be your hero? Um, and we talk about the funnel and starting at the top, um, the interview protocol that we use um, at our Children's Advocacy Center, which is a forensic interviewing technique. It's called RADAR recognizing and responding to abuse disclosure types. It's a long acronym. Just to give you a, a show and tell visual, this is a 60 page forensic interviewing protocol. Every time a child is referred to our center from law enforcement in Wake County and Child Welfare in Wake County, who we then share with Triangle Family Services for Therapy, that we're partnering with the school system to work with them in their zone, they are in school. We have to go through a 60-page interview with that child, but this is not an interrogation. This is about me looking at Chris right now and saying, tell me why your mom brought you here today. That's it. Opening the door for children. Tell me more about the night that your dad hurt you. And giving them permission to open up. Um, one of the former speakers before me talked about pacing with children. Giving them time. And in our haste, which comes from a very good place to rescue children, we sometimes overlook their well-being. And what I encourage you to do, because you don't know, you're also people. And there's going to be a child in this community that looks to you that has something to share for the first time in their life. Maybe it's a one-time experience. Maybe it's a child that's experienced polyvictimization. And are you able to stay calm? Are you able to be patient with how much they want to share with you? Are you able to say the very most important things to them? They're just two. Thank you for being willing to share this with me today. Thanking them, and then secondly, acknowledging how brave and courageous they were to open up to you. Two simple things. Thanking them. Acknowledging how courageous they are, and then moving it along to the professionals in our community that are responsible for taking care of those children that are trauma informed. I'll leave you with um, three things. One comment to highlight the importance of the ACES research. There was a 16 year old that sued the county of his residence. And in court, they said, what damages do you think you can sue this county for half a million dollars for? And he said to that judge, for the scars in my brain. So that is just one example of how powerful this research is. But also a poignant example of why we need to get to the front end to prevent these adverse experiences in the first place. 
I'll share with you one that I engaged with right at Thanksgiving. Um, a mom who is homeless with her newborn two-month-old baby. How awesome is it to help that mom and that baby find shelter, to find employment, to find a safe place to put that baby down at night, to rest, the food, all of those things. Those things that you can do just with a new parent, whatever their needs are. And finally, my score is one. I'm very fortunate. And I will tell you the most powerful thing that helped build my resiliency when I was in elementary school, Jeffreys Grove Elementary School. I went on a field trip to Wake County um, Courthouse and sat in my father's courtroom who was presiding over a custody case at that time. And the father was not fulfilling his basic obligations to his children. And my father, who sat in his robe, pointed across the courtroom and he said, Sir, you see that little blonde girl right there? There's not a day that I eat before she does. So it can just be that simple. Acknowledging we can't erase it all. We don't have that kind of magic wand. But we can acknowledge that kids will be okay, and we can help them be resilient, and we can help them be whole and productive moving forward. Thank you. Now I'll introduce Kim Martin Stats. She's a visitation coach with Buncom Pony, Buncom Pony Health Department. And what I want you to know about Kim is she has been the key staff person recently for the Buncom Pony ACES Collaborative, and they're nationally recognized for the work they're doing. They've been just amazing. They've been really very generous with us. Uh, we want to talk with them a number of times. They've done phone calls with us. So listen to how Pam, uh, how some of the organizations they've worked with are giving kids choices and letting kids know they have choices. Um, I came here as uh, Sarah said from Buckham County, um, I came from the UK two years ago um, to Buckham County and worked uh, with the Mark Club, which is mobilising action for the community uh, the Johnson Foundation for two years. Uh, and we in Buckham County have focused that entirely on adverse childhood experience, but trying to get into the community more rather than driving it as a prescribed professional agency-led um, topic, we're trying to get out of the community much more. Um, and I think for two years there's been some amazing things, there's been amazing initiatives going on in Buckingham County. Um, but I've just recently moved from that role into being a visitation coach for um, the DSS, uh, the foster care system. And I am shocked about how little drawing the phone work is going on in that environment. So I'm going to go through just one of the initiatives and some of the amazing things that have happened um, and that I've experienced in both the county um, and in other areas of West Carolina. Um, but then I'm going to come back to at the end just um, some of the things um, that those kids are going through in the foster care system um, that is not being addressed. Um, so what do we know? I mean, I think people have said so far already, chronic exposure to traumatic stress is increasingly understood as a common denominator among children, youth, and adults. Um, traumatic experiences include a wide gamut of situations, ranging from, uh, ranging from physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, family and community violence, the community violence is something we're focusing on a lot in Buckingham County, natural disasters, much more prevalent these days, wars, you know, so for, for all the, um, uh, the victims of wars, and closer to home, the cumulative impact of evictions, poverty, racism, and oppression. Repeated exposure to traumatic events without adequate support, particularly from an early age, can have devastating long-term impacts, impacts on health and well-being. This we know. That's a fact. People have talked before about the kind of scientific evidence of that. 
So what do we do? We develop organizational trauma informed care. That's great for moving forward. A systemic approach to service delivery that is grounded in an understanding of the causes and consequences of trauma and promotes resiliency and healing. That's what we try to do. A lot of people here today are driving that agenda forward. The trauma informed organizations ensure that the mission, culture, and practice are aligned to recognize and support trauma survivors. And we, those organizations doing this work, go through a process to adopt practices so people have better lives. So how do we do that? The theme of today is what's working in Wake County. I'm going to talk about some specific examples of what is working in Buncombe County. Um, there is a need for systemic, systemic change. The smaller examples that are cumulative do move us forward. So uh, I think the title of what I'm talking about today is about superheroes and capes. Um, there is a team of people who work in uh, one of the hospitals in Buncombe County who are called child wipers. Um, and they go to any situation where children are brought into the hospital, especially the emergency room. Um, they are conscious that the children are already traumatized, and then if they have to have shots, have cannulas fitted, or anything like that, then they are being restrained, quite often held down to have these things happen when they've already had trauma. So they've developed this idea of working with the children to make them superhero. So they talk to the children about what their superheroes are, and then what they do is they use pillowcases as a cake. So they put the children's arms into a pillowcase. If they are able, they can do a design on the pillowcase, otherwise the child might do that. So they put their arms in the pillowcase, they become their superheroes, and once their arms are restrained in the pillowcase, then it's easy for them to get shots, um, if that's what's needed. They also have a, a, a hole cut at the bottom of the pillow, so when their arms are in there, they can also have the necklace and the eye of the arms so, um, so this means that the child being, is not being restrained, but they become part of what's happening to them rather than something being done to them. Um, and you know, once we're working with this, empowerment, collaboration, and choice are often emphasized in the trauma informed model. And these examples fit into that idea. Um, the next thing is. Uh, I don't like targets. This is in, in a, a different hospital where they have um, uh, an oncology department, children's cancer department. And in there, on a piece of paper, on a large piece of paper, the children get to write what they don't like about the hospital being in hospital. And then they are given syringes full of water, which they spray at the picture, and then all of that runs down. Those pictures are framed, and they get to take them home when they're done, and the children keep them, their targets as a souvenir to show that it's not that bad in hospital. So these are small examples of things that we can do to help the trauma of the children. Um, and on, on a different level, as far as um, emotional first aid in the community, um, we had uh, something called the Herd Project in Buckingham County, which was peer-to-peer -peer counseling in the community. Uh, and a colleague of mine, Lucia Dowerty, uh, developed this so that um, adults would do peer to peer counseling. They worked with the TIP training program in Buckingham County, which is Trauma Intervention Program. And this is the immediate emotional and practical support to survive in the first 72 hours. I think um, people are talking about what happens in the first 72 hours after trauma. Things that people don't remember um, when people are giving them information. So, what we have got is people in the community. Um, working with other people in the community to take the information that they're not getting into their brain through our mind. Um, and uh, they're working with people who look like me and know what I'm going through. Um, so it's a much more community-centered program. Um, I'm running out of time, but we also have um, community-based culturally sensitive teams who work with the children in the community. So we have a group of people um, that's run by them. Keenan Lake, who my dad had taught me that. Um, and he has uh, boys out of the neighborhoods who are struggling with trauma. And um, what he does is he takes them in and he gives them the nurturing, the one nurturing adult or group of adults that help those kids with trauma. Um, just pretty quickly, I'm going to tell you a quick anecdote, uh, anecdote about a boy um, called uh, Tyler who 
who um, at nine years old saw his second brother killed in the game shooting. Um, so and he knew at nine years old that because he was running with the same gangs and he kept experiencing this trauma over and over again, that that was how he was going to end up. At nine years old, he had temerity to actually seek help, and in both accounts, because we were more and more, um, they were led him to. Uh, my dad was told me that he, where he got nurturing adults. Again, I think somebody earlier spoke about the fact that he was allowed to make decisions for himself. Uh, he was also given the task of being a leader for other kids in the group. So he got the gang group together and um, he managed to um, uh, change his life around. He said to me at 13 years old that that trauma informed care had saved his life. And I just think that that's, that's a phenomenal uh, thing to say. Anyway, I'm out of time, so I will, uh, I will leave it at that point. But there is, there is many, many anecdotes in Buncombe County of things that they do as trauma informed, uh, but it hasn't reached the foster care um, and the DSS part of the community because those children that I'm working with at the moment are alive. Their brains are flipped constantly, and uh, there is no work being done to help the children when we focus on what the relationship is between the parents and the children. Thank you, Kim. I hope you feel as inspired as I do by all of our speakers. I'm going to share just two more real quick things, and then we're going to move into your conversations about what you have lived and what you'd like to do. Um, I just want to say quickly, in talking with Alice Lutz earlier, she also shared with me that professionally at work, she holds problems for her staff and she tries to celebrate successes. And also that personally, meditation, yoga, and time outside are all helpful. And I'll tell you, all of those things and other things you heard today, those are all considered trauma-informed responses or things that do the self-regulating of the nervous system. So just, just know we can do things at all levels. And then the other piece, the Wright School in Raleigh. About 30 people saw the film last week, and they made a number of decisions and commitments. Um, so here, here's what they committed to. To use the ACEs screening that their parents could intake to increase parents' knowledge of stress on the brain and how stress affects children and how to do stress management, increase mindfulness activities with students, and incorporate Ms. Kendra's story from the film. So that's just another example, yet another example, of an organization determining what's the perfect fit for them to do. So, we're going to shift so you all can talk. Take about five minutes to share with each other what stood out to you and is most energizing for your work or your contribution around increasing resilience. And I want to tell people in the back, we have seats up front. Again, if there are seats at your table, please raise your hand so people can be part of the discussion. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for your time and for making these visits. Um, just know over 1,800 people in Wake County have seen this film so far because of our efforts and all the community partners. Um, and that number is growing. It includes 600 school counselors, social workers, and psychologists. And Later this month and next month, there's a major institution who has over 700 of their employees signed up to view the film. So we will be screening and we'll look forward to telling you more about that later. Uh, if you haven't seen the film Resilience, we can lend out the DVD to groups. And you also can come to one of the screenings at Marvel. You're invited to invite anyone from your organization, other groups you're in. Anyone can come in a free, open to the public. Marvel has been so generous. We're doing screenings through the end of the year, and um, Marvel is also working to add some additional ones to the schedule. So just know um, that's something you can do. 
So we talked about what's next for you. So here's what's next for AHA on this. We're going to host more events like this one over the next several years. Uh, Loading people in Lake County is a lot, and it's going to take a little time to spread more words. Um, the ACES Resilience Steering Committee and Advisory Board is meeting, and uh, we're using a results-oriented approach. The steering committee will be defining the measurable outcomes and putting together working groups. Those working groups are going to our definition of success, so we have targets to aim for that are targets people think that can be done and they have the resources and access to do. Um, and we'll be putting together the work plan. Right now there are 70 people, maybe, of 56 organizations. Part of that process so far, but we need more voices. Uh, the people who come all have different thoughts and different access to the parts of the community. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to us. We do need more people engaging at multiple levels. Uh, AHA is fundraising for this work, and we continue to invite support from our corporate and philanthropic partners and individuals alike. And basically over the next six to nine months, we will be creating a system that will do this work again. And we're using proven methods uh, that have worked in other communities for change. So, so please be a part of this, and also give us the grace during the window where we're beginning it together. And Lauren, do you have final thoughts? I just want to thank everybody for their time today. You know, I get asked from time to time, why is this attorney if you become engaged in this work? And the National Institute for Justice has found that a abused or neglected child is, has an increased risk of being a juvenile delinquent by 59%. An abused or neglected child has an increased likelihood of adult criminal behavior or violent behavior. So folks, I come to this work, one, because I care deeply for our community, but two, because I care deeply about my responsibilities, as I know you do in each of your roles that you play. Now, the one thing that I really want to talk about very briefly before we leave is for those of you who have seen the film, the thing that struck me the most about the film, really two things, is day in and day out, whether it is in a classroom or in a public setting or in the criminal justice system, we see behavior that we don't quite understand and that we feel like may be damaging in our community. And what I would ask is that you stop and that you look beyond that behavior. And that's really what this is about, what all of this is about, is what is at the root of some of the manifestations of some of the crises that we're all dealing with. And I think if we could just take that very simple action of just taking a pause, a time out, when we see something that strikes us, and thinking about what really is happening with that individual. I hope that you will take away from today some very important things to think about about how you can implement some of this concept and work within your day-to-day -day operations. You know, Google is a great thing. There's all kinds of studies out there, all kinds of ways you can learn more about this. We have wonderful resources here within our community that can help with that process. And so I encourage you to do that, to be invigorated today as you go out to continue this dialogue. Finally, I want to just thank you and AHA and our corporate sponsors uh, for their support. And I would ask that you take away, and even if you're not in a position yourself today to help with this continued effort, um, to make sure what you went through today and pass this envelope and information on to somebody else who may be able to support this work. Because I want to see our community as that perfectly timed and operational crew team where we're all growing together in the same direction to make sure that everyone in Wake County can have a successful and peaceful and prosperous life. I wish the best holidays for all of you. Thank you for being with us today. Take a muffin on the way out.